It's Thursday, June 9th, 2016. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, uh, Twitter plays Geek Nights. Let's, Let's do this. this. So, uh... Up over the weekend, uh, you know how sometimes the toilet just starts running a little bit, and you know, like jiggle the handle, like it makes noise. That thing that a lot of people's houses we visit just do constantly. So I replaced the bit that causes that problem, and I realized, the rubbery ring on the inside. Uh, yeah, the little rubber thing that the flap that comes up, the flapper. Yeah, I need to replace my flap too because mine also has a tiny, tiny leak and it yep. constantly makes noise. It started doing it over the weekend, and I was like, "Well, nope!" And I just I went to Amazon. I immediately ordered it. And the funny thing was, and I was you like, "Fixed your own? You didn't get the super to fix it? Why? What I? But the super would take like a week, and then they'd come in and track some. Like it's it's a pain in the you ass. You should take it with you when you leave the apartment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> put the old one back on, like a shower head. But I paid like a dollar for it. It took oh, me okay. 30 seconds. How did you get one that's the right one for your toilet? Uh, so, well, the, how I did it this time is I sat down and I said, fuck, what kind did I get? So I searched And did for you flap- like empty the tank by like turning the water off and then flushing? And So, so I've, I guess I've done a lot of handyman stuff a lot. Mm-hmm. Tell, so, so basically, uh, I go Would to you Amazon. you wear gloves and reach your hand in the toilet? Why even wear gloves? It's clean in there. Mine, mine actually has, I have a problem, a separate problem, and that not only do I have the Wait, t- wait, what problem could cause that water to be unclean? Poop coming back up? No, like what? N- nobody did an upper decker in there that I know of, but there's some sort of Silt? like, there's some sort of silty residue up there. Uh, and my I toilet does the same thing. That's I, don't new, know, I don't know how to clean it out. That's a New York thing. That just oh, happened. is it a New York thing? Okay. It's, there's silt in a lot of our water, especially because it'll happen anytime they like... But it's only in my toilet, not in any of my water sources. Yeah, because it's pretty diffuse. And I don't know, and it keeps dirtying up my bowl. Yeah. So, so how do I clean it out of there? Uh, Empty it and just clean it out with like paper towel and a scrubber. That sucks. Yeah. Or just leave it there. It doesn't hurt anything. Uh, it makes my toilet bowl. I have to clean my toilet bowl more often because it keeps getting brown. Oh, it doesn't get into the toilet bowl. Mine's Mine does. Dense. Usually, when that happens, it's because there was recent construction and they shut off your water at they some didn't point. Shut off my water. You don't know if they did because in New York they pretty much always do it because it'll happen in a neighborhood. And if you don't have a doorman, like they won't even tell you. Between like noon and three on a Wednesday, the water will just be off. And then it'll be on again, and most people have no idea this uh, happens. I guess that could have happened, possibly. It's actually pretty common. The only reason I know when it happens here... It happened at work a lot. Yeah. It happens all over New York, but because we have a doorman, whenever it happens, the doorman puts a sign in the elevator that says, yo, water's not going to work for this one-hour period on Thursday. Mm. So I just know every time that happens. It happens, like, once every couple months. I mean, maybe, like... Oh, a little less than a year ago, the water main way down the street broke, but that was like six or seven blocks away. I don't think it was affecting me. My water yep. worked fine during that period. But anyway, so uh, I go, to, I sit down at Amazon, and I'm like, oh, wait, what the shit? For time to, there's a Kohler toilet, I think. I, so I just type flapper valve, and the first result that shows up I'll replace mine too. is <laughs> one that says, you purchased this on this date three when years did you, ago. When did you buy one? I bought one about three years ago because Emily's toilet has started running. Oh. So I just clicked rebuy. <laughs> it came the next day. <laughs> I spent 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> so There's a recent song called Rebuy that just came out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically all you got to do is just look up like the name of your toilet. And there's probably... My toilet doesn't have like a model number written on it. <laughs> uh, I didn't even... I just looked up the name, the maker of the toilet because my toilet is made by Kohler. I guess I have to look at the flap and then look I at mean, the I mean, what, picture. you'll have a Bemis? <laughs> or a Kohler, like I don't even know any other names of toilet brands. I got a white, the most plain Gennaro white porcelain potty you've ever seen. <laughs> if, and it's New York modern building. I will bet <laughs> you a dollar it's a Kohler. I don't even K O H L E R or something like that. I'll take a look at it. <laughs> but yeah, I, so I replaced the thing, and then I was thinking because I know a lot of people. Some of these people I still know. Where they will say things to me like, oh, you've got to jiggle the toilet to make sure it stops that running. That means it's broke and fix it. Uh, and they've been mine, that way. Mine, is, mine doesn't have the jiggle problem, but... So it, mine started to have the jiggle but problem, it, too, but so it, do, I it, it, it just makes noise, but there's no, there's no point in jiggling. It just constantly makes noise. So when I... Well, usually know. the jiggling will, like, reseat the flap a little bit, and then it'll, like, stop it temporarily, but once you flush, it's gone again. No, I mean, mine will... If you, No matter what, if you jiggle, it'll just keep making noise, because, like, there's this tiny leak in the thing. Oh, mine would just, like, get kind of, like, weak, so it would fall into the hole a little bit, but if you jiggle it right, it would get a better seal, and it wouldn't run. 
Mm. But the the flapper was a little loose too, so I fixed that. That took I don't know eight seconds. I don't know. There are a lot of people out there who seem to like when something minor happens to them in a house, especially houses. It's not even apartments because at least some lazy people will call the super in an apartment. But like people who own houses will not fix obviously annoying things forever. Like they'll just never fix them. It's just like, well, there's a hole in this wall. I guess this is my life now. This hole is just here. I mean, if something is not broken to the point where it actually like, you know, like people have a computer that's all slow, but it's like they're still getting their work done. They'll just suffer through the slowness. Yeah, but why? But it, like suffering through your toilet making an annoying noise basically all the time, wasting water constantly when you can spend a dollar and 30 seconds to fix it? People like, are, you just not know? They just don't you know. You just think toilets work that way because your parents never replaced your flapper valves? <laughs> they don't even think. <laughs> it's kind of like how a lot of people we know have really nice houses, and yet they have the default, like, shit-ass shower head up there. Mm-hmm. Like, guys, 20 bucks, you can get a real shower head. Like, I don't, know, I don't understand people this. People don't upgrade their software either. Or the people, because today I noticed this. I was biking. And I'm not complaining about fixies, but this other <laughs> class of people, they have bikes with gears usually. Don't use them. But, well, I'm not even talking about that. But I'll see them biking because I pass them. And their bikes are squeaking so loud. Squeaking and clanking and rattling. Like, you've probably never sprayed anything on those gears. Mm-hmm. That chain is probably dry as I'm my surprised. dead bones in the desert. <laughs> I'm surprised the chain just doesn't snap and you fall over. Like, the bike is screaming to you to end its misery. Like, have you never maintained a bike before? Mm-hmm. At least the stupid fixie people, you know, they make a big deal about, oh, I got my simple bike and I care a lot about simplicity for some stupid reason, even though it's objectively inferior. <laughs> but these are the people who have a more complex bike, obviously maintain it less than the simple bike and the bike still goes and they it, complain about it being they're like that's low maintenance yeah <laughs> like you can take a bike with gears literally never maintain it and while it'll squeak and squeal and scream at you constantly and rattle and be slow uh it seems like 80 percent of new yorkers ride bikes like that everywhere so mm, still works oh uh, the toilet still removes the poop so they don't you know, that's it, right? Why don't... Here's a YouTube video. Go around the city, buy, like, one thing of lube, and go around the city to bikes that are chained up on the street and just lubricate them all. Just, like, lubricate and make a video about it. Mm. Go for it. But public service. Like, you're a superhero. I'm going to lube your I bike I have out. extra lube. You can go do that. I actually do have extra lube. I, gotta, I, I accidentally bought... I thought I was buying one, you know those tiny, like, Teflon, like, you squirted in, like that one? Mm-hmm. I ended up actually buying a four-pack... Uh, oops. <laughs> One of those things will last me like a decade. So, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone needs some bike lube, mm-hmm. so you got any news? I uh, couldn't really find any normal Geek Nights news, so I guess we'll just go with the serious news, right? So, I'm sure anyone who is a person who knows information knows that Muhammad Ali, one of the greatest people to ever live, has passed away. And that is not usually, we don't usually talk about celebrities dying on Geek Nights, right? Usually because most of the time we don't care. It's just people. I mean, there's millions of people dying all the time. Yep. And why? Just because you're a celebrity doesn't make you any more important than anyone else. But Muhammad Ali is more important than everyone else. Muhammad Ali. <laughs> I mean, one, if you don't know, like, we're not right. here and to not, inform you. It's not even the fact that he died that is notable because, to be honest, it was like he was dead. He's had Parkinson's disease and been, like, basically not able to do much for quite a significant period of time. So it's like he's been dead, right? What's notable, I think, is, you know, the fact that he has died obviously brings out, you know, everybody who, you know, never knew who he was. And you can see the typical internet reactions, but mostly, you know, the, the yeah, we expected it, but when you act, you know, there's the reaction that you expected, but once you actually see it, you still shake your head, which is the... Punk kids who didn't know who he was because they're too young. So, yeah, like, I, I'm going to link to it. Uh, it's kind of my thing of the day, but I'll just talk about it now. So, there's a famous, famous monologue that Billy Crystal, and already half of you were thinking, who's Billy Crystal? <laughs> <laughs> did. And basically, he recounted Muhammad Ali's life up to that point as a monologue. And it was funny, but serious mm. because Muhammad Ali's it's life It's also amazing that people haven't seen this. Yeah, like this is this was a staple. Like I just like everyone saw this, everyone knew about this. And 
Uh, apparently, uh, Billy Crystal's going to do or did the eulogy for Muhammad Ali's funeral. Like, he was that, eulogizing Well, considering that Howard Cosell, who also, people listening to this don't know who that is, yeah. is died in, like, 1990-something, right? But most of Twitter <laughs> was not either... else left who's They were like, who the hell is this Billy Crystal, and why? what the hell does he have to do with Muhammad Ali? <laughs> <laughs> and who's this Cassius Clay guy? Like, was it his brother? <laughs> like, I found some shit poking around on the internet. <laughs> oh my god! The thing that I saw the mo the, the thing well, this, I shake my head at the people who don't know who he was, right? And I think it, I think the '90s was like the cutoff, right? Because like I was born in the '80s, which is still after the end of his career, pretty much. Yep. Right, but. I still knew everything there was to know about him and saw all his fights before YouTube and then saw all his fights again when YouTube came out. Like, he was the last right. great hero of boxing. And I mean, he was also just kind of a hero as a person. There weren't, I mean, there aren't really, if you think about, you know, true, like, actual heroic human beings that were real people and weren't fictional, there really aren't many, right? Who alive could you say is, like, at the superhero level? If Muhammad Ali I, what had other, not what existed, other person can you even think of the that's guy, on this level? The guy that they made Hotel Rwanda about, the NATO guy who saved all those people? Sure, he was great. Or the but, UN guy, UN, UN. Right, but he's not, he's not even like half Muhammad Ali level. But there's the thing. If you took, if Muhammad Ali had not existed and you wrote a movie script about a guy like Muhammad Ali with that level of just humor and presence and record and everything. It seems like a fictional person. Like, people would say, that dialogue's unrealistic. No human is that clever <laughs> in conversations. <laughs> no human's that funny. No human's that real. And no one could be that good of a boxer. Right. It's like, so here's the things that people still don't understand, right, if you're a punk kid, right? First of all, people don't understand that between the year, up until, like, the 80s and 90s, right, and actually up until the 90s, pretty much, Boxing was the number one sport, right? Football was not the real deal. Football is in the United States, football is number one. And in the whole world, soccer was always one, right? But before the 90s, before like the end of Mike Tyson's career, right? And like Tyson Holyfield era, from that going backwards all the way back to like, you know, Joe Lewis times, right? In the ancient days, like 40s, 50s, right? Whatever, you know, Max Fleming, whatever, right? Boxing was the number one sport in the entire world. It was the most important thing there was in sports, right? Horse racing was like number two, right? Yep. You know, baseball was bigger than, you know, but it's like football, ice hockey, basketball. Those were all like sideshows, right? The way that all these other sports are, you know. And if you were the heavyweight champion of the world, you were like the most dangerous man on earth, right? You were like the most famous, mo it's like, you know, you look today at like some of like the biggest like standalone individual sport athletes like like Novak Djokovic, who's like the champion of tennis right now, or like Tiger Woods, right? Muhammad Ali was like ten times as famous and big compared to Tiger Woods. And right? what's very important is that mm -hmm. he had a voice that would have otherwise been ignored had he not had that fame. That the position he held, his skill at boxing, made him so powerful in society that the shitty white people couldn't ignore him. No, you couldn't ignore him is the most... That's like I mean, look at this Wikipedia. Look at this <laughs> record. It's just like this crazy sea of wins. The years where he wasn't allowed to box because he refused to fight Vietnam because he refused to go kill brown people overseas when, you know, when <laughs> they never called him nigger. They never did anything to him. <laughs> he didn't what, actually what? say that. He, he said, said something like that. He said, I, found I, two he said I ain't got no quarrel, no Viet Cong. There was another longer quote that he gave in an interview that I pulled up a little right. while ago. I'll find it because it right. was really good. Right. But that's another thing, right? Is so, you know, he was, right, a Muslim, right? And we are here at Geek Nights very anti Sky Man, right? Yep. So you think, why are you so in love with Muhammad Ali, who is as pretty much as pro Sky Man as you can be? Well, the fact is, is that even though he was pro Sky Man, he was Malcolm X Sky Man style, uh -huh. right? And the fact is, that type of Islam that he believes in, right, it, yeah, okay, he believes in a ridiculous sky man that doesn't exist, which is not good, right? But that imaginary sky man's imaginary teachings happen to be the same thing that my complete lack of sky man also teaches me, right? It's like... He was, you know, he wasn't, uh, you know, like a terrorist <laughs> Muslim, right? Like killing everybody. He's like, yeah, he refused to go to the war and kill Vietnamese people. I would have done the same exact thing yep. for a different reason. And they suspended him from boxing in basically his prime years. 
And when he finally won his court case, because, again, he was so famous and powerful that he couldn't be ignored, he finally won, he started boxing again, and he was still an unbeatable powerhouse. Nate Silver wrote an article a little while ago on 538 that said that his greatness defied statistics. Yeah, I mean, basically you had this, like, invincible human being, right? There was a comic book that's famous, like Muhammad Ali versus Superman. It's like, yeah, and that made sense because he was the closest thing to Superman that ever existed, right? This isn't like, you know... Like, even Wayne Gretzky isn't even half as great, right? Wayne Gretzky's name is The Great One. Not even, you, you could combine, like, Wayne Gretzky, Babe Ruth, and Michael Jordan, and you still wouldn't have one Muhammad Ali, right? He's like a historical figure, like Alexander the Great, right? This is, this is like, you know, a supreme, amazing human being, right? People don't understand, because they weren't alive when he was still a person that you would see, you know, walking around and talking, whatever. Right. So I guess it was what, that big. I guess what I should say to you guys is that he was a hero to p- multiple generations of people. Like we grew up at the end of the era where kids looked mm. up to this guy and like really understood and remembered him. And his we were, we were probably like the last generation yeah. to understand who he was. And his message and you know everything mm. that he stood for as a person for the most part is not only relevant today, but it's sort of starkly relevant. Like, really wish Parkinson's hadn't taken him out, because we could kind of use him right well, now. Well, I mean, you know, he got punched in the head a lot. Yeah, <laughs> but he punched a lot in the head, too. <laughs> right, I mean, basically, and the thing is, right, you know, here's, here's the other major thing, right? So when he started his career, right, he was going to fight Sonny Liston, right, after winning the gold medal at the Olympics, right? And nobody gave him a chance. Of course nobody gave him a fucking chance. People, you know, as little as people know about Hamad Ali, people don't know anything about Sonny Liston. At the time... Sonny Liston was the scariest, most dangerous <laughs> motherfucker to ever walk the earth. Because if you were the heavyweight champion of the world, you were the scariest, most dangerous, most famous athlete on the face of the earth, right? Like if Sonny Liston, if you heard he was that he was going to be in your town soon, you would run away, right? It was just like the most dangerous human being there ever was. And some punk kid who's like 20-something is like, is like so incredibly confident that he's going to beat the shit out of him. Like imagine if you saw me... Right? Coming up, like, oh, I'm going to beat up Superman. Yeah, I can take him. I can take him. I'm going to take him down in eight eight rounds. No, seven. No, I'll make it six. I'll take him, right? People, and you see me with, like, not looking very scary at all. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I'm this beautiful, you know, human being. Right? You know, I look kind of strong, but I don't look scary. <laughs> I don't look like I can take Sonny Liston on. <laughs> right? And I'm acting like I'm going to do it. Right? First of all, everyone's going to hate you and think you're a moron and bet against you. Right? Which is why it was such a humongous deal. Anyway. So people, uh, people just don't get it. It's like if, you weren't there. I wasn't there and I get it. How come you weren't there but you also don't get it? You I guess ha- if you don't you know You didn't have to be there to understand. If you don't know anything about Muhammad mm-hmm. Ali you, and you, you, you're you, still every, curious <laughs> why, who this Cassius Clay guy is we talked about earlier too. Uh, watch the Billy Crystal thing because it's inspiring and the most beautiful thing about it, I watched it again because I hadn't seen this since I was a kid, is that it has this little insert of Muhammad Ali watching Billy Crystal. Uh, like Asian TV. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, it's it's really inspiring, and it's, it's a good thing to watch. You mean, you should just actually watch Muhammad Ali fight also. You should also read all the things he wrote and said, because he... he I mean, this boxing is, is... Boxing gave him the platform to be what right, he was. Right, but all, you know, he sought, unlike other people, right, he sought out the camera at all times, right? He was a person who tried on purpose to, like, go out there. He wasn't someone who was like, you know... You know, like you look at, say, some current athletes, like, you know, no comment, you know, like I got nothing like Marshawn Lynch would be like the example of someone who just like avoids the media at all costs. Or like when, pe- when a- even athletes that don't avoid the media, it's like they only talk to it as much as they have to. And they always make politically correct non comments and they don't say anything. Right. And it's like, man, I really wish one of these athletes would just say whatever they really wanted to say all the time. The thing is, whenever they do, it's always like ridiculous, racist nonsense. Right. But it's like we already had that. And you really, you know, (laughs) in a way, not doing it is sort of like, you know, you know, sort of like saying, look, (laughs) I can't do it as well as Muhammad Ali did. Oh, so I'm not even going to bother. In his Wikipedia article, there's an entire section about his trash talk. Why not? Like a big separate section. All Ali Ali regularly taunted and baited his opponents before the fight and often during the bout itself. He told Frazier in the match he was too dumb to be champion. (laughs) Uh, This is good stuff. So another kind of interesting news. You know AlphaGo, like, 
humans have no input in Go anymore. AI's got it. There's something really fascinating going on now, and I'll just link to one of these, but basically they're pointing the same AI, Google's DeepMind, at Atari 2600 games. Well, that should be pretty good. I mean, Pong should be real easy, right? <laughs> just like... So, the rationale, but they're not seeding it with historical information or historical games. Uh, right, because they, they wanted to do AlphaGo just like self-trained 100% instead of training it on previous games, which they did. Yep. Well, they did both, but, right, but they I'm seeded it with they, goal, all the history of Go. Yeah, but their goal was to be able to do it with only self-practice. So this is interesting because the AI is give, it's basically this AI is learning to play Atari games the way me and Scott literally don't play Atari games. We were little... We sat down in front of an Atari, we could see the screens, we could hit the buttons, we didn't have the instruction books, and we would just sort of do stuff until we eventually figured the game out. I mean, but are they telling it things, for example, like, you know, the score going up is better? Because usually if you have, like, a normal old genetic algorithm, you would say, like, oh, score up better, score down worse, and then it would figure things out. Are they doing that, or are they just... So they did a bunch of different things. Or are they letting it figure out that score should go up? So get this. This is where it gets crazy. They did a bunch of different things, but they're trying something. The goal is they're calling it intrinsic motivation. Basically, they want the AI to get addicted to finding novelty, because the only way to find novelty in a game is to progress through the game. Mm -hmm. And basically, like if they don't give it that sense that goal of try to make things happen that i've never seen right before. it doesn't know how to value one thing over another right it, it basically it could, just goes it back play, and forth. it could play pong and decide that losing is good it basically went back and forth between these two screens and never really progressed anywhere as soon as they told it with no other thing to seek novelty then it's explored already more than half of Montezuma's Revenge, which is one oh, hell of it's an not, Atari it's not game. playing versus games it's playing a single player game yep it's just uh. it has all the buttons of an atari and it can see the screen, and that's Isn't all it's it got. Isn't it always going to put it on lowest difficulty? Uh, maybe. <laughs> so I'd like to. I'd rather it play Outlaw watching, against itself. Watching this is fascinating. It's a lot like watching an AGDQ, and I look forward to the day when AGDQs will basically just no one AIs. has to manually make a tool assisted speed run. You just have an AlphaGo does the speed run, and there it is. Yep. I mean, AlphaGo, like, think about all the human effort. Now, it, I'm not saying it was wasted in the sense that the people doing it enjoyed it, like the Final Fantasy IV run where the dude fucking, like, memorized random Right, scenes. but imagine if we could just have a computer just, like, make the perfect run. It would discover things you didn't even discover doing frame by frame. Yep. So this is just really fascinating stuff. But again, I stress, the reason I bring up is new, this up is news. Uh, AI is moving so much faster than you realize and like you saw, Google's making their own chips now just for AI. Like they're not even selling them to other people. They're making their own chips to use themselves to do. Google it's like doesn't a have a flag. fab that I know of. Uh, they, are, they are either acquiring or building one. I don't know the full or details Or did they of just it. buy like one of each machine and make a tiny fab so that they could make like one chip at a time? It's, it's not quite how it works. Yeah. I don't know. But so actually, I didn't know. Are they I using don't, FPGAs? The reason I know they're not. So the reason I didn't <laughs> read. I, like, I don't know all the details of that, is that that's my Monday news, and then we skip, skip to Monday shows, I'm doing it the next Monday. But they're making the Tensor chips, TensorFlow stuff. So basically, they're chips that only do the stuff they need for neural networks and nothing uh, else. It's making a hardware version of... Yeah, so yeah, the TensorFlow, TensorFlow stuff. So they can basically... They're just taking their software and making a hardware chip that does what the software does to make it go faster. Because if you... Because think of it this way. A general purpose computer has to... The calculations That would be like if I made accurate. a Counter-Strike chip and then it was a computer that just played yep. Counter-Strike. It's just like, yeah, there we go. But it's a little more unique than that because this TensorFlow stuff is kind of fuzzy logic or like... It's not like... The, you know, the old days where Pentiums, if you multiplied certain numbers, would get the wrong answer, and how that is that was, not acceptable. That was one Pentium chip, and it was like one specific Well, it was the first run of Pentiums, and, yeah. and it, was, it was that they were not accurate beyond a certain point in floating point calculations. Yeah, there was some register or something that was busted, I forget. Nah, it was a logic error from what I read. Anyway. I could go look it up again. I, I looked it up to do a talk on it at like 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. It never mattered. Keep an eye. It mattered to a few people. <laughs> Keep an eye out for this AI stuff. Like, I bring it up on Thursday because Monday is like, check out what it's doing. And Tuesday would be AGDQs. But Thursday is, this shit's going to affect your life in a real way way sooner than you realize. Probably. The other thing that was funny today is... Uh, you know the the president like the nomination process in America is over. It's Trump and Clinton. They're running. Like that's eh, it. Whatever. But 
What's interesting is that nothing. The crazy candidate, from all reports, actually like reads his own Twitter himself and like types shit into it. Which is crazy because, like, any professional politician hires someone to do that for them. Also doesn't have time to do that. Yeah. So, and it appears that the crazy one also takes it all really personally and, like, literally just responds to random people. And it's just, like, that sort of thing is happening. So, the Hillary account tweeted something that was, you know, you know the delete your account. Like, Trump said something dumb and it was like, delete your account. And it, it went crazy viral. What was interesting and I didn't even think about this until I found these compilations. This is one of them. Anyone older than, like, 35 has no fucking idea what that means. It means, like... It means what you said is so egregious that you should just delete your account and literally go away from this social network forever. Right, as in, you know, you have a Twitter account, delete it so that you don't see your tweets anymore and you stop tweeting. Yep, like, you shouldn't be on That's this service. That's what I mean. I mean, it's pre- and there's no jargon there. It's delete yeah. your account. What's... The main, like, regular old media, like, and it's CNN. Like say, it's like, say, like, if someone says something stupid to you and you say, kill yourself. Yeah. So this is a video, and there are many of these, of all the sort of mainstream news outlets around the world who don't understand what this means, trying to explain it badly to the people who watch TV news, meaning the people who also don't understand what it means. It is amazing to watch the generational divide so starkly and clearly demonstrated. Well, you know what? As you know, you might be laughing at those people, but hey, the people who know what delete your account means, uh, they don't know who Muhammad Ali is, but the people watching the news do. So. Yeah. Uh, mm. Of course, at the same time, the people who are watching the news also have their hands on the money and power, and, at least currently because they're old. And well, old also, I'm sure money. some of the people watching the news uh, are those racist types who are like... They know who know, Muhammad Ali is and like, they use his slave name because they hate him. They hate him or they're like, you know, die Muslim, whatever, right? They're that kind of people. So yeah. fuck them. Things of the day. I already talked about the Billy Crystal thing. Just watch it. Like, seriously. So, <laughs> You're just using your news as your thing of the day. No, because that was my thing of the day, but it was relevant, I guess. So I guess I got another thing here. Uh, this is a video of a guy who is playing around with a steady cam, like a for real one, and he's got a $70,000 fancy camera on the steady cam. The steady cam that like you wear with like a vest and shit. Yep. And he's like, holy shit, this is amazing. And he's like, check out how stable this is. And he starts jumping around and acting the fool. And uh so if you've never used a steady cam before. You gotta be first of all, to use a steady cam in the first place, you gotta be jacked, right? Like I couldn't wear one because it's too heavy. I would just like fall over. You could you could wear this one. I don't know. They're very, I've seen like every time I ever see someone with the kind where there's a vest. They look way bulky. They're not that heavy. No, no, no. But every time I see someone wearing one, it they're always a buff dude. Like you know, you ever see cameramen? Cameramen are always huge. You never see like a little skinny guy. Most being of the a cameramen, cameraman. yeah, but a lot of them aren't buff. They're fat. They're still listen underneath that. They're fat, large. If you took all the fat off me and all the fat off them, they would be jacked, and I would not. Be. <laughs> I still wouldn't be able to do a push up <laughs> if I had less to push. It's because I lack in the pushing power, not in the. So I'll put it this way: not that the pushing is too- steady cam type things like these camera stabilization things are amazing technology, but they're the kind of technology that will fail on you in crazy ways if you're not trained and you don't know how they actually work. Like tempered glass? Yeah. (laughs) So this guy lets the arm extend a little too far because it'll, like, you can jump up, you can let go of it and jump up and down and it'll be perfectly steady. But if that arm extends a little bit too far, like beyond its safety, then now you've got this long, thin, skinny arm with a lot of like mechanical logic in it, and you've got a really heavy camera on the end of it. It hits the safety threshold, and it just collapses. Why don't they change the hinge so it can't extend farther than it should? Well, no one who's ever used one of these things would make that stupid mistake. Because one, to put it that far away from your body, to get even close to You'd that have threshold, to fr- you have to like let go of it. Yeah, to get like, it that close to the threshold, basically. you already have to be a moron. No one has an arm that long. I'm trying to think of an equivalent, like to get to the point, you'd have to like run away from it, <laughs> <laughs> like leave it there and run. Like to turn, like imagine you're riding a bike and you just suddenly turn your front wheel 90 degrees to the left as hard as you can. <laughs> like, yeah, the bike will let you do that. Uh, you know not to do that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so this guy basically turned the wheel 90 degrees to the right, and it is a sublime moment. <laughs> All right, so here's a video that I saw a long time ago, like in the RIT days. It, it went around, I think. 
Uh, this was uploaded to YouTube when? That'd be interesting information if I could see. I noticed it. That's, that's like not on the front page of a YouTube video anymore. Like yeah. it used to be a lot more prominent when it was uploaded. I think YouTube pulled that away. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, this video is from 1998, right? And basically, what happened here is there was a hacking group. Oh no, it's still there. I see it. Well, it doesn't say it in the app. What does it say out there? Oh, I'm not on that video. Let me go to that video now. I picked a random video. I had YouTube open. Oh, anyway. So this video was... Uh, March oh. 14th, 2011. All right. It's a long time ago. The video is from March, May 19th, 1998. So this is, there was a hacking group called Loft Heavy Industries. Obviously, the O was a zero and F in Loft was a PH. Um... And it was a big deal because these dudes, with their hacker names like Brian Oblivion, Kingpin, Space Rogue, Mudge, Weld Pond, Stefan von Neumann, <laughs> right? These dudes, who are like the most stereotypical hackers you've ever seen, uh, testified before Congress. Uh, and when the news reported on this in 1998, basically all the news said was hackers testify before Congress and say they could take down the internet in 30 minutes. But really, there's a lot more that they testified to Congress. And this was in a day when Congress was a little bit better than it is now <laughs> at interviewing yeah. uh, people <laughs> and getting, you know, asking them questions and trying to actually learn from them instead of, you know, being real dumb. Uh, it was a little bit less corrupt than it is now. And this is a really interesting uh, congressional testimony if you're a nerd of any kind, especially one who cares about technologies. And, you know... It informs uh, a lot of, you know, what uh, our government thinks about technology these days. Yeah, and I feel like the gulf between... I saw this a long time ago. I haven't seen it recently, but if I it remember... Just, I, it's think, it just came back up again, yeah. so I had it liked recently. Well, like, my thing of the day on Monday is going to be that elevator hacking thing from DEF CON. That thing's way old, but it came up in my feed. I was like, all right, that thing. Mm. Uh, fun fact, they gave that lecture at the end of DEF CON, because imagine if you gave a lecture on how to hack elevators at the beginning of a long convention of hackers. I mean, they could have fixed the elevators in that hotel. And no, then, no. It's just, the, 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 the gist of that video is an elevator is just an unsecured stairwell. Yes. Also, if I was the person doing that presentation, I would have, during the presentation, triggered the elevators in that hotel to do what I say. <laughs> and been like, oh, and as I'm speaking, the elevators in this hotel are all going to the basement. <laughs> the elevators in this hotel have all uh, exited their shafts and are armed. They're all going up to the roof with the doors open. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what this video, uh, the as much as there's this wide gulf between the people testifying and the old men who don't know better interviewing them, that gulf is like four times wider today than it was back in 1998. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. So, in the meta moment, the book club book will be Oryx and Crake by Margaret Atwood, even though The Handmaid's Tale would probably be more relevant to the current state of America, possibly. But uh, i got to finish the last Wheel of Time book first so I can do that last special podcast with Cahill White at PAX Prime. I'm halfway through the last book of the Wheel of Time. Tell me about the snake people. I know what's in that tower. I know what the deal is with that tower. I know what's up with Mazarum Tame, that motherfucker. Uh, I learned something interesting. You know how the SNI can make a, and bond a man as a warder? Mm -hmm. So the male wizards later, they learn that they can bond a woman the same way. Mm, why, why do two people bond each other at the same time? So someone just did that, and it's like... Uh, D don't. It's, that's a bad idea. Okay. That 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 causes pro. Basically, that happens by accident, and it's it it's like if you see a script that was written poorly starts looping, <laughs> it's stuff goes down. So yeah, I'm gonna know a lot about the wheel of time real soon. Mm -hmm. uh, the Patreon's going strong. I just uploaded, and I'm gonna rapid fire the rest of these now. The second of the beta episodes of Geek Nights, and the craziest thing is that as I upload these, people who apparently have still been listening to Geek Nights and hanging out in the forum, who haven't posted or said anything for five-plus years, are all coming out of the woodwork. Uh, some people who remember these episodes. How could you remember some beta episode? Uh, because our, our friends listened to all of them and gave us feedback. Oh, uh, I don't know so, what's wrong with them. Yeah. Uh, what's great about this is that the first one was pretty entertaining, like the first thing we ever did just for various reasons. You can hear my commentary. The commentary that I did when I remastered them will be free for everyone, not just patrons. I'll update that. I'll upload that over the weekend as a public update so you guys can hear the commentary. Uh, what I'll say is this. 
if listening to that first beta episode, you were somehow under the misapprehension that we figured out what we were doing and made a good show, like, right away, uh, the second episode will disavow you of that illusion. I think it's, you know, it's like Penny Arcade, right? It's like, yeah. the first one's bad. The only difference is that the current Penny Arcade is real good, and the current Geek Nights is still bad, just less bad. We decided that we needed to argue more, so then when we did this one, like, we start some bullshit arguments, and then we get really mad at each other and just keep arguing and keep arguing, and then at the end, the, this beautiful, like, don't listen to it, it's actually really bad, just listen to the commentary, but in the very, very end of the file, I interrupt Scott, and I'm like, you know what, this episode got stupid, just cut it off, and then Scott says, well, you're the one who made it stupid, you started one of your <laughs> arguments, and literally I say, what do you mean, what, and then the audio cuts out. <laughs> 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 like... I imagine we must have argued for another hour or two after that. I can't imagine that we didn't, and we didn't record it. Mm. But it was tough to listen to this one. We don't know shit, because we're arguing about shit we don't know shit about. What did we argue about? Uh, you argued that there is no culture of anti-intellectualism in the United States. That's wrong. Yeah, and I made an uh, an incredibly... Are you sure that's what I said, or are you not putting words in my yeah, mouth? Yeah, Scott. Why would I say that? You, uh, so... The, and so the United States is nothing but... You and I also talk and argue about politics a lot, but we it, like we get way out of the shit we know, and we clearly do not know a lot. At one point, we both start talking about what language or languages might be spoken in India. And let me tell you, we're real dumb in 2005. Listen, people don't learn things <laughs> by, by being young. Yep. <laughs> this is why. <laughs> it's relevant. Uh, I, I was watching Simpsons clips the other day. Whatever the age I am is the age you are when you're the smartest. There's this one clip where the, the producer for Itchy and Scratchy just comes in to a focus group, and he's like, you kids are all stupid. Uh, stupid. You don't know what you want. That's why you're young, because you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we uh, had some ideas for what to do the show on. We actually considered just doing a whole show on Muhammad Ali, but I figure you you're better you're you better served by reading his Wikipedia page. You're better served by just YouTube for like until the crack of dawn. I mean, yep. once you start watching, you know, Muhammad Ali do anything, you're gonna be watching for like days. Yeah, like I really wish I could have met him or hung out with him or just talked to him. He'd have been happy to talk to you. He He's talked to, he he talked to, to talk to anyone. Yeah. <laughs> so I tweeted uh, earlier today at 11:51 a.m. What should we do the show on tonight? And I got a lot of sub suggestions. I'm just gonna go through these. We're gonna pick one. If all of them are bad, this is your fault, Internet. Uh, Andrew Malim said Syria. Uh, no, next. I don't think. <laughs> so my response to him was, "Quote: If I had to make a list of things Scott is least willing to talk about." Either on Geek Nights or in real life. <laughs> I'll talk uh, about Assyria. Uh, Assyria. Oh, you want to not not to, the, the Assyrians came down like the wolf on the fold. The cords were gleaming in purple and gold. Yes, that kind. Uh, real like current Assyria, like that region politics, or do you actually know about old ancient Assyria? I know about fictional ancient Assyria. All right, like, <laughs> that fought that fought with fictional Jews. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'd be interested to in show on ham radio, but I'm probably I don't the know only much one. about ham radio. I can tell you that in Summer camp there was you, you could you know where they had every nerdy thing. Ham radio was one of the nerdy things, and it's pretty much only the old grognard types that do ham radio. Not a lot of young people. It's the kind of thing where I hope that a few people I know are into it enough. Because if like say Mad Max or something crazy happens, that shit gets real useful real quick. Yeah. Otherwise, eh. Mm. Uh, I was actually really into radio as a kid, but I didn't have the money or the time or the inclination to do a ham. Just use like CB radios that truckers use. So I was about to say, I actually, use, I was a CB radio hobbyist. Like I had all these different crystals and I had a base station with a fucking big antenna that was probably illegal. I mean, if I, I see the apocalypse come, just buy some on Amazon or bust into a truck and take it. I had random just conversations with truckers driving by. Like I learned a whole bunch of stuff. I used to know more about like radio etiquette back then because of yeah, that. Yeah, no one cares. Yeah. But I don't have enough. Go watch Contact next. <laughs> uh, conspiracy theories. Don't believe in them next. Uh, Terminator 1 versus Terminator 2. Terminator 2 is a better movie next. Terminator 1 was a good movie, though. Yeah, it was not bad. I, not, we could, it was you know like, what we could do? It wasn't even half as good as Terminator 2. Did we 2. ever actually do a show on Terminator 2? I haven't or watched it in a couple of years. Hop, sometime down the road, like when it's bad outside. Let's watch the two Terminator movies and then review them as Thursday episodes. We used to do a lot we of movies. We did Jurassic reviews. Park. We can do a Terminator show yeah. on all things Terminator. Uh, you have the two movies. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, t -t 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 
Uh, b- b- also, the Terminator 2 video game. Dig- Matt dig- dig- offered dig- to do a guest episode and do a review of the state of New Jersey. Call him. We could review the state of New York. Call like, him right now. Wanna give, he said he's busy playing Overwatch. I think that means he can call him right now. Luke, Bur- Luke Burge suggested driving. Just driving. I don't think we ever did a show on that. It's fun, but don't do it if you don't have to. You don't have anything to say about it? I, I could tell you I'd do a whole show on driving. I got anecdotes about all I feel all like those. we've done this already. We might have. I don't know. Uh, and also future transport, like the future of transportation and driving. The car will drive itself. And hopefully, so eventually, actually, there that, won't even that be a car. So actually, some problems, though. I was thinking about this uh, a couple weeks ago. Self-driving cars are great, right? Yeah. Here, there's one drawback to them. Right now, if you're, if you're one of those terrible people who insists on living in the suburbs and driving an hour to work every day, at least you're punished for it with a horrible commute. If you have self-driving cars, we'll probably quadruple the traffic and all those shitty like suburban towns will be full of commuters driving to work, like riding to work in their pods, and we'll probably actually make closer in mass transit and like city infrastructure worse in the short term. Mm, I don't think so. Uh, why not? I mean, I I don't know. Like, this is something I've thought about, but I haven't really formed a concrete opinion on it. I mean, just because you're not driving the car, it's still gonna if it's still gonna be traffic. If there's too many of them, more than the road can handle, right? Yeah, but will it self-driving cars? Will they just increase the like? Will they overload the roads? Also, people are gonna like get in those cars together because you're not gonna like want to own one because that's that defeats the point. You're not gonna have True. idle cars, right? So you're just gonna, a car will be on your street somewhere. You'll get in it. But right? I guess there's a wider problem. That'll like, improve society by making people socialize with each other. Like, will it reduce the need for mass bulk local transport, or will it cause an explosion of? Towns like Beacon that are kind of sleeper communities where well, I mean, just commute. Even if people stop getting on the Metro North, first of all, right, the, the thing could just take you to the Metro North because then what the fuck is the difference whether yep. it takes you to the train or not, right? But also, the cars can just all hook up to each other and make a train, in which case it's just a fucking train. It just has a lot more wheels. What's the difference? Yeah. And actually, what one thing, you know, the, the, my counterpoint, like my counter argument to that idea uh, is that... Think about what happened in a lot of the developing world where they never had phone infrastructure and then they leapt to cell phones. So they skipped like one generation of bullshit. It's like in Civ 5 when like I build a bunch of bullshit spearmen, but what if you just don't build spearmen? You get to the point of making pikemen, you skip a whole generation, save a ton of money and just make like the good stuff. You know, uh, that's what I would have done. <laughs> yeah. But I don't have, you know, if I had money right now, I could have like a knight. But I, instead, I have a horseman because not because I don't know how to knight. I, I have think, plenty. I have all his armor sitting around, but the armor smith won't sell it to me. <laughs> I know how to make it. You don't. And I'm like, dude, uh, listen, your whole blacksmith shop, this whole town's gonna get burnt to the ground if you don't just give me some free armor. <laughs> we have so much iron. Just give me free I armor. It's like, is, no, you gotta pay. You don't have that many humans living in your cities because I I have my three one city. my one city. I have three cities. I'm gonna have a fourth real soon, and all three of them have more population than your capital. Yeah, I couldn't get because I I basically lived in a desert place. There's not there wasn't enough food. Yeah, you think I started in a good place? I had no. I still have like so low food, even though I got the tradition plus food capital. I feel like we should start the fourth game. And I feel like that also, but we can let this I one go until like it's <laughs> over. We could start the fourth game because if we start, I'm picking, the fourth I'm game, picking someone who is war based and duels only war matters. Uh, I was not going to war you at any point. I'd never plan on actually invading you. The only reason I'm going to is to end this. <laughs> I was planning. Well, we'll see. I made all those videos. Uh, then you could have left my caravans alone then. That was a like 2007 era Geek Nights tangent. <laughs> <laughs> I posit that possibly the fact that the US never had mass transit anywhere except New York City, pretty much, might, and we built all these highways. If we jump to self driving cars, suddenly and skip over bullet trains, every single highway we built becomes mass transit, and America has this explosion. We have this amazing infrastructure, except for all the bridges that are collapsing, <laughs> but suddenly it turns into mass transit. Like, there might be a renaissance in America if we survive the next 20 years of our infrastructure collapsing. Mm-hmm. We'll see. That's uh, it's very optimistic. Uh, well, it depends. Do, do, do. It doesn't matter because you, it's here's the problem. Right? Even if that if what you say is true, right? The self-driving car doesn't go 500 miles an hour like the bullet train does. You need the bullet train. You can't. Why go- do you need the bullet train for? So I can get somewhere in less than fucking 10 hours. Yeah, where are you gonna go? Where do we go? We go even to if Seattle. I was going to Boston in a self-driving car, it takes for fucking oh, yeah. ever. So there should be bullet trains <laughs> along the Northeast Corridor and along the West Coast, but nowhere else. 
I mean, I, there should be one that just goes across the whole goddamn country. Why can't I take the train to California? Why? Who would ride that? Flying is actually way better at that. I mean, the train is uses less energy and goes just as fast. And How fast does the plane fly? About 500 miles an hour. How fast does the bullet train go? You know what? If the bullet train was going through like the middle of the nowhere that is the middle of America, it could go probably even faster than 500. It could probably uh, go six or 700. I'm not even going to touch that one. I'm just going to let that stand. You don't think the, the really long train uses less energy than the plane that has to not only go forward but also go up? I don't think bullet trains are the solution to transcontinental You think uh, that like a, a nuclear power plant hooked up to like maglev rail is less efficient than a jet engine? Uh, I think planes are still better at that. Mm, I don't know. I also, mean, you never saw the train movie, right? Which one? The tr- There's only one train movie. Galaxy Express 999? All right, there's only one train movie that's not animated. Uh, trains, planes, and automobiles? Uh, that, that, that's also planes and automobiles. And actually, that, that movie is mostly cars, so... Uh, the General with Buster Keaton? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that is also a train movie. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's the only train movies I know. Deciding what <laughs> restaurant to eat at. Uh, the one where... Er- deciding what to do the show on! <laughs> That's Chris Reimer suggested. We've done that already. Did we? Yes. When? A long time ago. When? We've done that like a hundred times. We've done this exact episode we're doing now a hundred times. No, this where episode we're actually doing, we're doing, the, we're, I don't think we've done one that was stated goal. We're just going to do a show on how we decide what to do the show on. I don't think we've ever done that. This is what it sounds like to decide what to do the show on. We bring, we do a we five bring minute, up We bring up crab people. We do a one to two minute show. I reject most of them. Yep. We find the least... The, the, the most tolerable crab people, and then we settle on it. The threshold for what's tolerable continues to drop the hungrier we are. <laughs> uh, deciding what restaurant to eat at actually could be a good show to do. Not I now. I don't think we, we could do 20 minutes. I think we could. So uh, here, here's the topics, all right? So here's how, here, I'll, I'll give you guys this, because we're not going to do this show on this, because this show is actually almost done. We've been going for like 50 minutes. Uh, there's the one, the problem of like conventions, like deciding where to eat, Forming the group of people to eat, splitting up the groups, reservations, how everyone just fucking sucks at that. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to say there. There's probably like eight minutes of stuff on that. There's us ourselves and how much easier that got when we moved to New York. And there's literally like 30 restaurants within a 15 minute travel of our apartment. Plus Grubhub. Uh, in fact, you could grub up from multiple places to deal with the picky people. We could talk about the picky people and how you just need to cut them out of your group or don't, don't invite be, them. Don't be picky, babies. If you're going to be picky, then... Look, I don't like certain things, right? You know, everyone doesn't like certain things. But if like, if I go to a restaurant, for example, like, I'm not really into radish. And like, you know, radishes... What, radishes? There's a restaurant that has just radishes? I mean, radish is okay, but like, I will never buy a radish. I'll never intentionally put a radish in my food, right? I won't order a, a radish-focused dish at a restaurant. But uh, if I get a salad... That's fair. If I get a salad and there's mad radish on it, or even moderate radish on it, you know what? I fucking eat it because I'm not a child, right? It depends. So when, you, so when you go to a restaurant, if you have like celiac disease or an allergy and you say, no bread, please, that's absolutely acceptable. But if you say, no radish, you're a fucking baby. Just fucking eat it or order something else. Now, it is one thing. Let's say the, 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 like the menu listed the things in it, and it didn't list radish, and yet radish was a significant component. I mean, that's somewhat a valid complaint about the restaurant being bad. Like, say you even asked, like, hey, what's in this? And they still, like, didn't mention radish even once, and then it's just, like, covered in radishes. That's a little weird and bad. Restaurant, don't go there again. I've run into those situations before, but it hasn't happened since I moved to New York. Mm. There's also, so there's a side topic there. I, re- I noticed something. This is a problem that I never considered specifically in this context until the last pack south because mm. remember we needed to find a place to eat and everyone was crowded and had a long wait mm-hmm. and pa- like san antonio is one of those weird places where despite being crowded restaurants will take reservations which i think is ludicrous like if you're a good restaurant and you're like filling reliably there's you should no, never take reservations there's no need to take a reservation like in new york no good restaurant except the super super upper end places that are so expensive they don't fill like no one takes reservations you're mm-hmm. just like stand outside for an hour if you want to eat a salt and fat yep or go at like the worst possible time. It's like they're gonna fill all their seats. They don't need your reservation. And we had a constraint of we had a pretty large group of like twelve people, and we all wanted to eat together. Now, 
in the old days, like I, don't know, I think everyone else always wants to everyone eat together. I'm happy to just eat, and it's like just split up, guys. Make it easy. Well, that's it. In the old days, just go as wherever. A group, we would like put great effort into being able to all eat together, and I've decided that that is always a wasted effort, especially at like a convention or whatever. Right. But there's a side thing. We found a place that would seat all of us immediately. Mm-hmm. And we got a giant table, and that seemed fine. And in fact, I noticed this happened a bunch of times in San Antonio. There were restaurants that had the seating to accommodate a giant group of people. However, places like that, places that aren't like New York or Chicago that have a huge population of people doing that sort of thing all the time, they have slow kitchens. They're never going to have a kitchen that could actually deliver that much food in time. So... You run into the situation in San Antonio where you'll find a restaurant that'll seat all 20 of you right now, and then it'll take them literally an hour and a half to bring out your food. Mm. So that's a further no, new argument. One, don't go to places in cities that aren't New York or Chicago. If you got 12 people, right, don't even go up and be like, we got 12 and we can split up. No, just say we got four. Table for four. We got yep. three tables for four. Now the drama problem is that usually in any in in any large pretend group, you don't know each other. Fo fo fo. Well, in any large group, you, of you, people, you didn't get my fo fo fo. I reference. got your fo fo fo. Yo, oh, you get that reference? I think so. What is that reference from? Uh, it's nothing with Ross's. Got it at Ross, right? No, no, I got nothing then. It's a basketball reference. I don't know what the fuck that is. Then <laughs> I don't watch basketball. <laughs> I don't like basketball. <laughs> I don't know anything about basketball. All right, go ahead. I'm bad at <laughs> basketball too. Like real bad at it. Like preternaturally <laughs> bad at basketball. If you watch me try to play, like right. it's awful. Continue. Uh, what was it? right? If you ever it, like sometimes like the front row crew, like when like in the old days, like when we'd all get together in Beacon, we all wanted to go to the same restaurant. Everyone wanted to sit with everyone else. Like, we were all chills. If we split up, it literally didn't matter who sat with who. But usually, if you out there or are at a convention or you have a large group of friends and you all decide you want to eat out together, there are definitely a lot of people who don't actually want to share the table with certain other people. Like, there's the newer friends who don't want to be stuck with, like, the second-tier people. Like, they want to sit with the prime people. They want to sit at the cool table. It always ends up being the hierarchy of, like, there's two tables where, like, cool crap's happening. Then there's the table with all the people who aren't, like, super in the group. And then there's the table with, like, the super annoying CPM who somehow is in your group. You couldn't get rid of them. And there, I think we could do a whole show on how to find, like, how to decide where to eat, how to deal with small and large groups. I think we do a whole show Thursday. Mm. Want to oh, do? I wasn't season? listening. Hmm? I think people would listen. I think people would like it. I wasn't listening to you. Okay, what were uh, you doing? Reading some internet. Okay. <laughs> uh, IndyCar, it's car racing. I don't know enough about it. It's Pets mostly died. Frequent flyer programs and like so, like the JetBlue stuff or the. I guess the bolt bus thing I'm a member of that I get free rides from all the time. You do it a lot, and then you get free shit. What's there to I say? Think that, I, I mean, uh, the airplane stuff kind of matters because that's how I get like upgrades. Yeah, and stuff you can all the get time. a lot of you can get more value. You can get a, a large amount of values worth, and a lot of people do it. I don't understand why companies allow their individual employees to keep those benefits. I would though. not fucking fly anywhere ever if my company didn't let me keep my air miles. I would refuse. Mm-hmm. That's why. Right. Yeah. Like if I'm a company, I'm like, fly here or you're fired. It's your job to fly there. No, except literally no no one would do it, pretty much. <laughs> Partly the accounts are usually tied to individuals. Like the like the corporate there usually there'll be like a corporate pool and weird stuff, but generally no. You you use your own air miles. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, your company might say you're not like you can't buy that ticket. That's I know you want to fly Delta or whatever, but that ticket costs twice as much. Fuck you, you're flying JetBlue. Mm. Whatever. <laughs> uh one thing I can say is that I, I've seen people who try to min-max it and spend a lot of time like trying to game those systems. If you just spent that time working. Yeah, don't bother. The only, the only time it is worth your while to like buy air miles or some nonsense like that is if you're already in the wealthy class because then like it actually is cheaper than buying business class. If you're already wealthy, though, does, why do you even need to save fucking money? You're How, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I didn't get rich by wasting money. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck would do that kind of shit. I would do that. I mean, I'd do that a little bit. Like, I have all my frequent flyer stuff, and I might buy a bunch of miles on Cathay for next year so that Emily and I can just fly business class if we go to Australia, like something like that. Do whatever you want. It'd be way cheaper than buying a business class ticket. 
Uh, vaporwave. I'm not going to talk about vaporwave. Vaporwave doesn't exist. Comixology changing subscription model. I just don't use Comixology. I don't use that either. I would, but I read books on my Kindle instead. I read comic books on paper. Not because I'm obviously not anti-digital read things. I would much rather read things digitally, but comics, at least you know, most of the ones I read, were made with paper in mind. And unlike, say, reading a book digitally, which there's not really any fucking difference, uh, if a comic book is made for paper and then you read it digitally, that's like watching a widescreen movie on a four-thirds TV. It doesn't work. Uh, all right, home organization systems. Uh, I got a lot of thoughts to unpack on that one, so get it? It's not funny. That was real funny. No. Music? We, I, we had that's, to have talked about music. That's too general. Music we like? Al- had to have almost show all of it? <laughs> Music we particularly like? Almost all of it? I no, mean, you gotta have some like if you like if you're like A B test, like it's an Amonomarth song and pretty good. like a Beatles song. Pretty good. Like what if you had to pick one? Like prioritize. Which song is it? Yeah. To, it's gotta be somebody's like I don't like a lot of modern R and B that much. Uh Depends, but the, see, like that's a very narrow. Any like, any any genre that you pick out, and you you're right, gonna find, a, and like, you try to tell me I don't like that genre, I'll find you like some songs in that genre that are so awesome because I I think what I really like, like what about country or western? That's what I'm saying. Like, I like songs. I know some country songs. I like songs with a strong melodic hook, regardless of sound. Like you know what? I think Garth Brooks, like Thunder Rolls, that's just like a twangy country kind of cliche song. It's not a bad song. I like it. Like, you could take the same exact song and have some, you know, like Dolly Parton sing it, and then have, say, I don't know, Iced Earth sing it, <laughs> and I'll probably, if it's a good song, I'll like it both ways, and if it's a bad song, I'll hate it both ways. Uh, I actually prefer West, like, I don't like most country, mostly because I don't like the subject matter. Uh, like if it's the same, like... Well, yeah, I tend to listen to more foreign or non-lyrical music, uh, Cause then you can't because, hear the awful, awful lyrics, right? Because I won't hear awful lyrics, right? And awful lyrics include things that are just like you know, awful, uh, you know, gangster rap. That's I like, run into that pretty often. Know, I like a lot right? of rap and hip hop, and yet the lyrics to the, some of the songs that I really enjoy are fucking awful. Right. It's like it's one thing if you're sure mix a lot and you're like, I like big butts. It's like, I right, everyone like big butts. That's great. And then if someone's like, you know, I'm going to kill people and rape all the ladies, it's like, no, nobody likes well, that. Well, like there's a Simpson Wave song I like and it samples Just from stay with the song. Just stick to the big butts. And at one point the guy's like, if life's a game of inches, then my dick something something's like really... I wish I hadn't picked out that one part of the song. Is there is there a karaoke version of this song? Because I'd be down. With <laughs> <laughs> I can look at what the song is because I actually didn't recognize it at first. Right, uh, and it's like it's per. And you know what? You can make some some badass hippin' and hopping. Yeah, right. Without having nasty lyrics. You, for example, a recent example. Turn down for what? What's wrong? Yeah. Right. You can just say turn down for what. You can have a crazy ridiculous video. That's like a modern. I like big butts. Right. I. Unabashedly like Turn down for Will what? Smith's bubblegum rap. I like Will Smith. What's like wrong? I like that shit w- way w- more than you would expect me to. We live it in the millennium, yo. <laughs> <sighs> if only he'd make good movies again. Uh he don't need to. <laughs> if I was Will Smith is one of the smart people who's like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm so rich, fuck y'all. Uh music music. If I had to say what I'm listening to the most right now, though, it's actually legit. Simpson Wave? Uh, right now, today, I listened to, so, uh, Low End Entertainment, which is, like, one of the major K-pop labels, made a deal with Spotify. So all of these past albums and things that were never on there, it was, like, a huge dump of, like, new whatever, right? So, but right now, I think EXO just came back, and as usual, they have one good song and an album full of crap songs and one uh. good song. But they're, like, the biggest deal in the world, at least for other people. And then... I listened to like uh, Dvorak's ninth, sixth or ninth symphony. I ninth forget. is probably the one you're thinking of. I both, but I think they put on Spotify. There might have been this. I forget which one went on Spotify Scott, recently. Scott, if you really like him, you should. He's listen my to number like, one guy. You should go back. Uh, do you like piano concertos? Do you want like the big orchestra there? I don't really care. Go it's listen to a bunch song. of Franz Liszt. I already listened to Franz Liszt. Okay, you're not teaching me anything new here. Uh, have you ever gone deep into the Rachmaninoff? 
I don't like Rachmaninoff as much. But how do you like Lisp but not not Rachmaninoff? It's different. What? What? Describe how they're different. At least I, I don't. In fact, I don't, Lisp I don't, is more superficial, like tone poemy nonsense. Like this is a song about a painting I'm looking at. At least Rachmaninoff has the crazy skill depth of the piano part. Yeah, the ones I, the one I really don't like the most is Vivaldi. That's my that's my not favorite. Vivaldi's guy. good background music, I guess. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm really into lately? The kind of music they play in the clothing store. Like, I'll go into a clothing store and put on Shazam and then go home and listen to that. So it's funny. And not buy clothes. I said I'm listening to Simpson Wave. And like, I'm not joking. Like, I literally am listening to Simpson Wave. But that is very aesthetically similar to the kind of music they tend to play late at night in the rock climbing gym I go to. Okay. And I'm digging that aesthetic a lot. It's, this is sort of sparse. The, mu- the Muzak got to you. Yeah, but it's a step up from Muzak because it's a little more, it's more sparse than Muzak and yet more punctuated at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like sparser, more punctuated, melodic, and uh, rhythmic elements. Mm. Uh, basic income. So that's been coming up a lot, and I'd love, we could do a whole show on that probably. Mm-hmm. Basic guaranteed income. Uh, what's there to say other than we're just waiting for it? I think uh, I could say a lot about, like, could, uh, where could it succeed? Where could it fail? What would it do? What would we do? What's the threshold where we wouldn't work anymore? Like, that kind of stuff. If I can just live my life comfortably and not what have to What do you mean work? by comfortably? You mean comfortably, like, our New York, like, high fluting lifestyle? Or, like, living in, like, a shack outside of Albany somewhere? No, I'm not living in a shack. What the fuck? A warm shack, though. Like, you don't have to do anything. Does it have internet? You got internet, yeah. Can I still buy comic books every month? Uh, yeah, but you can't afford to go to PAX's. Well, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Why live? The problem is everyone was talking about basic income because they're like, oh, Switzerland's doing it. No, Switzerland's not. They're voting on it, and no one in Switzerland wants it to happen. The, almost everyone in Switzerland is, like, crazily, violently opposed to the idea of basic income. Also, they have mad money in Switzerland. Yeah, they but don't the, need the basic income. Like, the places where this is being put forth for referendums or debate the the tide is overwhelmingly against it. Like this is not moving forward. Because they don't need it. <laughs> uh, yeah, they do. There's poor people there. Yeah, but this not. <laughs> it's not mostly poor people like other countries. Uh, ride sharing like Lyft and Uber. Uh, those aren't ride sharing. Those are just like evil subcontractor, like slave wage slave nonsense companies that should be banned. Mm-hmm. Ride sharing is not what either of those things actually does. Well, they are doing some ride sharing. Like yeah, you, you, that's you a, can get an Uber and it might pull up with someone else in it already who's going somewhere close to where you're going. Yeah, you know what? No one wants that and like people even, do it because it's a cheaper ride than it's getting It's only your own slightly Uber. cheaper and from everyone I've heard who talks about it it is Russian roulette with what crazy motherfucker is sitting next to you in that car. Sure, I mean, like it is bad news bears. Right. And also, forget that the the, the people who do who drive those cars are just exploited subcontractors. Yeah, well, sure. Yeah, uh, zombies. No, we're not doing part four of zombies. It's never gonna rise from the dead. I got. I, there's nothing more I could say about zombies. Their their time has passed. Mm. All right, guess we did a show about that. We've done this show before, uh, where we go through a bunch of topics people suggest and shoot them all down. And yet somehow we went longer than we do for an average show. Yeah, because it takes a long time to do a bunch of things for five minutes instead of one thing for 20. We do more than four things. It's more than 20 minutes. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. The patrons for this episode of Geek Nights and the amount of money that they give us on a continuing basis are... Alan Joyce, Rebecca Dunn, Nicholas Brando, Heidi McNichol, Amanda Duchette, James David White, Christian, open parenthesis, Kuntz, MyStady.com, Sean Hayworth, William Eisenrose, Jeremy Miner, Spartacus, Spartacus, 
Spartacus, Iggy Kid, Matthew Smith, Kshar Tavishan, Joshua Joestar, Tyler Eller, Don Schleich, Sean Yeager, Clinton Walton, Ren from New Zealand, Robert Lee, Ryan Perrin, Drew Openlander, Ray Lavelle, Brian Cedroni, Rochelle Montanona, Finn Eric Silverod, and the Infinite Sadness, Kinetic Man, Aaron Cerise, Chris Midkiff, Chris Knox, Flame Darkfire, Sam Cordry, Daniel Redman, Chris Adad, Sean Klein, Chris Reimer, and Thomas Hahn. Yeah, we literally did just do a show on us trying to figure out what to do the show on. So, yo, dog, I hope you like the show. Uh, I think some of those topics have merit, and Scott never listens to any of this stuff. So, if you actually want us to do one of those topics, just post in the forum and tweet at us and talk about how good of an idea you think it is. Now, you really want to hear our opinions because that'll give me a little more ammo to trick Scott into doing a show on one of these things. But anyway, now I leave you with something odd. Wow. Who are you? Who? Who are you? Oh, uh, America Jean. America Jean. Shut up! No! <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh my god. Oh my god! Oh good! Oh my god! Oh god! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, God, it's this! Oh!